Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we have got it. We are streaming live and we are now recording. That's exciting. Yay, technology. <laughs> um, so I hope everyone is having a really great evening. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I am super excited. This event has been planned for, I feel like, a really a, a while now we've had um Kelsey on our schedule and getting Andrew to moderate which we're super excited about to have you know a couple of Tombolo's humans on board with this so that's really really cool um and I just want to thank you all for being here on behalf of the entire staff of Tombolo um I'm Kelsey I'm the events coordinator um so I'm the one you got the email from today with your zoom link um but thank you so much for being here. And I, just to give you a little bit of a, um, a couple of little information about Tombolo, if you're not super familiar with us, we're located in the Grand Central District of uh, St. Petersburg. So uh, you can come and see us now six days a week. We have um, scheduled appointments that are socially distant. So they're 45 minute blocks. Um, and we're, you know, we're doing it to where only four people in the store at a time for 45 minutes. And we just bumped it up recently to six days a week, which is super exciting because it means that people want to come hang out with us and we want to hang out with you too. So if you're in the area, um, get your, get on, get on our schedule and come see us down at Tombolo and come by summer of the cicadas if you already if you haven't already um and then uh we also deliver across the country as well and um we have contactless pickup also so if you would rather just grab something curbside we can do that for you too which is really exciting um and so i'm gonna without further ado i'm gonna turn it over to andrew and chelsea uh, andrew is one of our awesome booksellers in our social media extraordinaire so all of the cool instagram and all of our social media stuff that you see, that's Andrew. So um, I'm gonna let Andrew take it away from here. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, as you can see, I got the book rack behind me. I'm kind of pretending like you all are in the bookstore with me. I'm like looking forward and we just have the seats set up and you're all in the audience for this event. Um, once again, thank you all for joining us tonight. I am so excited and honored to get to talk to Chelsea about the Quill Pros award-winning book, Summer of the Cicadas. Uh, and by the way, like another say, like don't judge a book by its cover, but this cover is so beautiful. You can totally judge this book by its cover because it lives up to this wonderful artwork. Um, just give a brief bio on Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea Catherine is a writer living in St. Pete, Florida. After graduating from the University of Tampa with her MFA in creative writing, she moved to the Keys for two years where she served as secretary of the Key West Writers Guild. And she now lives with us right here in the Sunshine City. And we're so happy for that. Uh, most recently, Chelsea won the Mary C. Moore Award for Nonfiction through the Southern Indiana Review. And uh, as I said before, Summer of the Cicadas, um, published by Redhead Press, won the Quill Pros Award. Uh, so Chelsea, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, and there's myriad questions I want to ask you um, that I feel like at the start, maybe you could just give us a brief overview of um, Summer of the Cicadas. Uh, just describe the book to everyone. Sure. So um, the book is kind of, it's two different plots. There's the main plot of the cicadas that kind of take over this town in West Virginia, um, and they're not like normal cicadas. So they actually cause a lot of damage. They uh, rot the trees. They're attacking people, which is not something they do normally. Um, so that's the, the kind of what's going on on the surface level. Um, and the second kind of subplot is that the main character, Jess, is dealing with the two year anniversary of her family's death. So her family was in a car accident and all three of them, her mother, her father, and her sister were killed. So she's kind of dealing with, um, with the grief and, and processing what, what happened then. And that's the second part of the story. Now I know there's, there's a lot of ground to cover, but I feel like maybe just at the start, we can go, you know, why write about cicadas? Yeah, a lot of people ask me that, um, and I don't really know. Uh, I just love cicadas. I spent a lot of time when I was a kid every summer, my mom and I would go down to Louisiana. That's where she's from, and that's where I actually discovered cicadas, and I just was really drawn to them and thought they were disgusting and cool and just very interesting. Um, and so I thought, you know, they kind of popped up in some of my short stories that I did when I was getting my MFA, and I decided why not write a book about them and what would happen if they were 
you know, mega cicadas that <laughs> make havoc. That would be fun. So that's what he did. And was there a lot of um, research that went into that portion of the book? Did you find yourself taking a deep dive on cicadas or was it just based on your, your pre all just based on your previous experiences with them? So I did a little bit of research, um, but I've gotten, I've gotten commented before, like I don't do a lot of research. Um, I'm like, it's fiction. So I'm going to do a little bit of research and then whatever else the bugs need to do for the, for the job, they're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think, you know, I think beyond that, that's something that I think you've touched on before. And I think that's something that's very interesting with the novel is, you know, kind of writing unlikable um, female characters. Um, can you maybe discuss what it was like, you know, creating Natasha, creating Jess, um, and just creating the world that they live in? Yeah, so um, one of the things I love most is talking about writing unlikable female characters. And I've taught a class with, I actually piloted it with Keep St. Pete Lit, which is local here to St. Petersburg. Um, and I taught a class on how to write female characters that are unlikable, um, that are mean, that are, you know, you have trouble resonating with. Because um, I think that in a lot of fiction stories, we get male characters who are kind of awful. Like they're just awful characters. They're good, they're well written, but they're not likable. They're kind of awful, you know? Um, and I don't think that you see that as much with female characters. And what really drew me to the idea was an essay that Roxane Gay wrote. It was it's maybe like five, six years old. Um, and I use it in a lot of my classes. And she talks about, you know, why are female characters not allowed to be likable? Um, she brings up a couple of examples of, of women characters and how when female characters are unlikable, the writer usually gets um, critiqued as being a bad writer instead of people saying, I didn't like this character. And I just think that's really interesting. And it's, well, we all know why it happens, but I was like, you know, if this is happening, then what can I do to put more unlikable female characters on the page? Um, so starting with that idea, I thought about grief and how people are expected to get over trauma really quickly. And when they don't, people kind of say, well, you're taking too long, you know, you should be over that by now. And one of the biggest points in the book is, you know, it's been two years. It's not like this happened two months ago and she's still really processing it. And I kind of started with that, that idea of, you know, this elongated period of grief and how it impacts this character and just went, from there with Jess, but yeah. Now, how did, um, you know, so I know, you know, many drafts go into creating the final, you know, novels. How did Jess evolve as a character as you wrote this book? So when I first, the first draft of this book, um, Jess didn't have as much growth. Um, she didn't stop drinking. She didn't decide to move on. So my first draft of this was really just kind of piecing together her anger and her grief and her loss. Um, and it was not as satisfying, I think, as the final draft where she decides, okay, you know, I've done all I can do in this town. I've been chasing my family. They're gone. I can't stay here hoping they'll come back. I can't keep, you know, doing drugs and drinking and being a hot mess. Um, and I really... I was encouraged by my publisher to kind of explore that side of Jess and to find that new ending was really, really satisfying to find her kind of like um, going a little bit beyond where she had in the beginning. Uh, yeah, you spoke about working with your publisher. I mean, what, what's it like working with an indie press like Red Hen? It's really good. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't have any other experience because I've only ever worked with indie presses, but um, Red Hen in particular, Toby Harper is um, the person who started the Quill Prose Award and she was really good at, um, at the developmental edit for this book. Um, she came up with a lot of suggestions and ideas and all of them felt really uh, fitting in what I saw of the book and just helped me kind of go back in there for my developmental edits and really find a fuller uh, picture of this character and of the town and of the ending of the book. And about how long do you, um, would you say like from, you know, start to finish, how long did it take for Summer and the Cicadas to really come together? 
feels like it took forever. It, I started writing it in January of 2017 and I can pump out a novel pretty quickly. I think I was done in like three months. I think I wrote it in three months. Um, but yeah, it took like two and a half years, I think, from submission to publication, two and a half years. Uh, I'm very grateful that it's in the world now. <laughs> um, and I know you, um, you've recorded this really wonderful video um, where you kind of talked about, you know, some of the reasons why you wrote Summer of Cicadas. And part of it was, um, you know, growing up, uh, you, kind of, you wanted to write a book that you wish you had access to at a young age. So can you maybe talk about, you know, were there any, you know, sort of literary queer role models that you had growing up? Or uh, are there any contemporary ones that you think more people should read? Yeah, so I grew up in rural Vermont, and I talked about this a little bit at an event I did on Wednesday. And I think a lot of people think of the East Coast as being very industrialized in lots of cities, and like, that's not true. So I grew up in a really rural, um, small town, and I actually was about nine or 10 when Vermont decided to legalize um, same-sex marriage. So we had that going on. But then in my particular town, we had a lot of um, like feedback against that. So the, the thing that they did was take back Vermont and it was against same-sex marriage. And so I grew up with that all around me, just like everywhere. And lesbian was a bad word. And you know, when you made fun of someone, you called them the F word. Like it just was very present in my hometown. Um, and I never read any books as a kid a single, never read a single book with a queer character. I had no queer role, role models at all, no one. Um, now it's changed. I think in the last like five, six years, it's really done a 180. And that's, you know, I think thanks in part to Gen Z kids, um, they've really kind of pushed for visibility and made queer role models, you know, available to young kids. Um, and so now some of the literary people that I'm reading are like, I read everything Roxane Gay writes, like every tweet, everything. I just, she's fantastic. Um, Carmen Maria Machado is also like one of my favorites. Um, those two really have done a lot. And uh, the things that they're writing about, like going through trauma and um, kind of coming out on the other side of things really interests me. So they've been two of my my people I read a lot of. I know um, a lot is made of the the writer's process. Um, and, so, and I'm always just curious, like where do you get your writing done? Um, or do you have a, a regimen, like a schedule that you go where like, I wake up at this time, I write at this time, I go here. Uh, like what does what your writing process look like? Yeah, so I've talked about this a little before, but I'm, I have a full-time job and I'm a grant writer for a nonprofit. So I have 37.5 hours I have to fill with, you know, job, job. So I usually get up and I get to work by seven or 7.30. Um, I try to do my stuff early. And then when I come home, I'll pretty much have like an hour where I'm doing my own stuff. And then I write for the rest of the night. So usually from like 5 p.m. on, I'm writing, I'm editing, I'm whatever. And I'm pretty lucky to be able to do that. Um, I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. I don't have anyone that's taking up my time other than me. So I can just kind of do whatever I want when I get home. And that's been really, that's like my process is <laughs> only having to take care of myself. So. I think, you know, one of the, one, and you mentioned like keep St. Pete lit. Um, and I think that just represents the wonderful and pretty thriving art scene we have in St. Petersburg. And that, that, you know, goes to every medium, whether it's performing arts, visual arts, you know, written, oral, you know, that we have poetry open mics and all that. Uh, I mean, what have you seen like emerging in the St. Petersburg art scene? Or even like, I've heard a lot of people talk about the Florida literary renaissance. Do you think that this city and the state in general, they're more on the map now as arts destinations? It's becoming like that. And I mean, I'm thinking of a lot of the people that I read, you know, like Jakira Diaz is in Miami and like, there's just a lot of really good Florida writers that are coming up right now. Um, Lauren Groff, like there's just like a lot of people here. I think St. Petersburg is really uh, a special place. I've never felt more comfortable being myself and being a writer. And there's so much 
artist support here. So like um, all of the bookstores are really welcoming and there's a ton of, you know, arts nonprofits um, and, and councils and things like that. So St. Petersburg is very unique. It's also very gay, <laughs> which, you know, for a young gay artist, this is the place to be because there are people like you here. So I, St. Petersburg is really special and I think Florida at some point will get its act together, but I think there are spots where, you know, art is booming. And, uh, you know, obviously, I know a lot of authors have talked about either trying to write to this moment, whether that has to do with the current pandemic or everything else going on around the world. I mean, how is how is how are the current circumstances kind of affected your own writing? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I've talked to friends and some of my friends that are writers are like, man, how do you, how are you getting things done? How are you getting anything done? You know, it's, we're all kind of like strung out a little bit. It's, it's tough and it's a, it's a nationwide and worldwide trauma to go through a pandemic like this. Um, and the United States in particular is having a lot of other things going on. Um, for me, I write because it's, it's for my mental health. And if I didn't write, you know, I would be messed up. So <laughs> I write to take care of myself. Um, but sometimes you have to take a break. And I think I've seen myself kind of when I need to take a break, I give myself a lot more leeway and a lot more like grace when I need to step back if I need a couple days to just not look at the computer and to go and just like walk around the city or like go to the beach. Um, and I encourage my friends who write to do that too, because being productive as a writer, when you have a full-time job, when you have a family, when you're going through a pandem pandemic, when there are protests, you know, it's hard, it's a lot. So having grace to like take some time for yourself and not feel the pressure to put words on a page, that's, that's good. And that's, I think something that as much as people are able to do, they should do. I know uh, there's like this idea that we're going to get a lot of quarantine literature coming out of this or, or stories that deal directly with being, you know, confined. Do you think that will take place in your own work or are you more thinking you're going to, you know, stray away from that? So I talked with Maureen McDowell a couple months ago, like during the stay at home orders, I think. And we had talked a little bit about a book that I was trying to market that is about a girl who um, survives an apocalypse and is living on an island outside of Florida. And I started writing this story before the pandemic. So I started writing it about like three months before the pandemic hit. And I thought, okay, now that it's hit, maybe people will be really interested in reading stuff like this. So I had this book and I had another book um, and I pitched them both into the world. And to my surprise, the other book got picked up. So <laughs> I think there will be um, literature about quarantine and about pandemics and stuff, but I think my feedback from agents that I queried was like, not right now, not yet. Like we need a little bit of breathing space. So whatever people have written now, that's good. Just kind of stick it in your drawer somewhere, um, gives people some breathing space and we'll come back to it in four or five years when we've had some space from this. So I think you're going to see like what you're going to see coming out of the pandemic is sci-fi, fantasy, um, speculative fiction, magic realism. I think that will be really booming. And then four or five years out, you're going to see, you know, the isolation pieces. <laughs> so you talked about, um, you know, sort of pitching a book or getting, you know, a manuscript picked up. Can you talk about what that process is like? Um, this is something, you know, I'm so foreign to me. Yeah, it's terrible. Anybody that's done it <laughs> knows that it's just, it's not fun. Um, but I've pitched three books now. So uh, the process for me is to get a good first draft of the book. Um, and then I was unagented for my first two books. So the process there was, let me look at open contests. And a lot of publishers like Red Hen, they had the Quill Prose Award. It's open. You don't have to have an agent to apply to that. You don't have to have an agent to get in there. Um, so that's what I did for my first two book, books. I looked for um, I looked for contests and then just crossed my fingers that 
something would happen. And with those kind of contests, um, a lot of times if you don't win or place, they will still publish your manuscript. So it's always worth it, I think, to me to apply to those things because you never know who's going to see your book. Um, and then with my third book, I I did get an agent for that. Um, and I'm not sure what that process is going to be like. I think it's going to be very similar. So with agents, you query them like you would, you know, a literary piece, you send it out, you say, hey, are you interested? And I went through probably a couple dozen agents. Um, Summer of the Cicadas was rejected 12 times by agents. Uh, Blessed Be, which is the book I'm working on now, was over a dozen times probably going on 15 times, it was rejected. Um, so it's just, it's a numbers game. I say that all the time. You just, if you believe in the book, you keep going and keep going and keep going. So. Do, you, do you have any advice for maybe just any emerging writer who's looking to either get maybe even just like their first short story published or just working on getting their manuscript out there? Yeah, so if you're a short story writer uh, and you want to get a, a short story published, I would suggest submitting to places that you like the most. So whatever your interests are and where you find yourself being most captivated by the work, apply there because usually that's where your voice will fit best um, and not just places where you think, oh, this is highly ranked or this is the best, whatever. Apply it to the places you like and keep applying. So like for each piece that I put out now, um, for fiction in particular, it's very hard. I will apply to at least five different places. And lots of times I don't get any of those picked up. <laughs> but every once in a while you'll get one. But I suggest at least three to five um, for one piece. And then if you're looking to do a novel, it's really, it's really a matter of um, reading through agent uh, descriptions and picking the right people because agents all, it's very subjective and you could have the best book in the world, but if it doesn't fit, you know, what a particular agent is looking for, it's a waste of your time and it doesn't mean the book is bad. So being just like very careful about how you uh, submit with your books, that's, I think that's solid advice for a newbie. I know you've you've written a lot of short fiction in addition to the novels. Uh, can you maybe talk about like is there a difference in your own process when you're writing short fiction? Um, do you are you do you find yourself wanting to return to short fiction more, uh, or is it you know? To be really honest, I stopped writing short fiction this last like year and a half because the novels take so much work, and I kind of forgot how to write short fiction. I tried to write a short story uh, like a month ago and I sent it to one of my best friends and he was like, hey, so this is a novel because my pacing was all messed up. I forgot how to, you know, the, the way you place events in a short story and the amount of tension you have to have in each scene is very different. And I just forgot how to do it because I'm so used to having all of this room to expand on things and to have the characters take their time to get to certain realizations. So I think short stories are, you have to be really mindful of every, not every word, but more mindful than you do with novels. And you have to be more mindful of tension um, and the way that that your characters are discovering and moving forward on the page. Well, I mean, that's one of the strengths of Summer of the Cicadas for me is that pacing that you created in here. Cause you have like these really poetic descriptions of, you know, of, of you know, gazing at someone you love and then at the very end, in a very crisp short sentence, you just peel a band-aid to show a bug bite, and then you know hear the gasp of a city council, and it all just culminates, and it makes that band-aid peeling moment all the more resonant because we've just like been dealt this beautiful poetic load. And like, like having said that, would you mind if I just read one of the sure, one of my go ahead. I shift. My clothes make a stiff sound. Natasha glances up at me and her eyes meet mine. She holds strong and sure. She's not looking at me how I want. It's not with desire or envy. It's this soft babying look. This thing that makes me feel like a 15 year old kid in overalls all over again, instead of the lead investigator on this, on this case. My cheeks heat. I'm going to be honest with you. We don't know exactly why it's happening yet, 
but we've got about 100,000 cicadas on the tree line near James's property. They like to swarm and bite if disturbed. I hold up my hand and peel off one of the band-aids, revealing a pinkish red hole in my skin. The council breaks into grunts and whispers. Uh, I mean, I just, I love that paragraph so much. I mean, one, because I've sat in on many city council meetings and the grunts and murmurs are just like, it just sang louder than any cicada roar could. But it was just matched with that imagery always of the cicada, of this like pervasive humming in the background you know, of every page. Can you talk about what it's like to craft such really poetic paragraphs paired with really great dialogue as well? I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, for me, I was, the dialogue piece uh, goes back to my undergraduate professor who was really like my main mentor with writing. And she is from New York City and she wears all black and she weighs like 80 pounds and she's this very stern, stiff woman. And she drilled into me that like your dialogue should not have a single word more than what it needs to convey what needs to be conveyed. So your lines don't make them more than 10 words. You know, she really drilled it into me. And I think that helped in a lot of ways because when I look at dialogue, I'm very careful about every single word and every single word has to convey things. And, you know, not everything that someone says in one line has to be replied to because a lot of times in, in fiction and in real life, we're not talking about things that we don't want to talk about. We're skipping over things. And um, just her kind of, her work that she did with me on dialogue has really stuck with me. And as for the setting and sensory stuff, um, I'm a very tactile person and I experience the world like loud noises are a lot for me, crowds are a lot for me. Um, and I like spending time in nature and it plays a huge role in my own life. And so I think that comes out on accident in my books because I'm always hyper aware of things. And so usually my characters end up being more aware of those things than, than maybe other characters would. Uh, even speaking of mentorship, are there a few key pieces of advice that have stuck with you um, similar to the dialogue lesson? Oh man, I feel like every class I teach um, is really what I've learned from this one woman. Her name's Susan Osborne. And just everything she taught me about dialogue. Um, she actually is the one that taught me how to write a sex scene. Um, she's taught me so many different things. Um, she taught me a lot about plotting and about characterization. And she is a woman who was big on writing unlikable female characters and who really encouraged me to write them and also to be an unlikable woman when I felt like it. Um, so a lot of her, her knowledge, I think, influences me now, even when I'm not aware of it. And a lot of times when I'm teaching, like for Keep St. Pete Lit, stuff will come out and I'm like, man, that's Osborne, you know? And I had one of my, one of my best friends from college sat in on one of my classes um, when I was teaching up north. And he said, man, that was, that was a lot of Osborne there, you know? Like she just comes out here and there and it's very deep rooted into my writing and the way that I teach. How does um, teaching sort of influence your writing? I, I'm always curious about the relationship between the two because you're, you're focusing on helping other people grow their own creative works. Um, does that sometimes, do you feel like that inspires your work or do you feel like you sort of have to separate the two? I feel like sometimes when I'm talking um, or when I'm teaching, it's like me figuring out my own stuff, my own way of doing things. And when I teach, I have an outline, um, but I don't really go into it knowing what I'm gonna say. So I kind of have an outline and I have you know notes and things, but a lot of the times teaching for me is, yeah, I'm working with the class, but I'm teaching myself too. Like I'm learning my own structure that I kind of know innately and putting a name to it. And a lot of times my students or the people that are in the class will teach me like more, so then often they teach me stuff. Um, I have a lot of examples of students that would come in and they'd like type up notes and then email them to me and their notes would have this like brilliant like line that I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. Um, so teaching is learning. Like it just, you know, it's 50-50. Um, I know you, uh, you talked about how your, your professor 
sort of, she's the one who talked about even how to write like a sex scene. And I, I always like imagine with, with, you know, trying to write a good sex scene or a good action scene, um, whether, you know, it's a cicada swarm or a chase or something like that. I mean, how do you visualize that in your head? And what is the process of getting that onto paper? Because I feel like sometimes when you try to write it all out, it can really get, you know, sort of, you know, log jammed. Yeah, the way, and this is not like anything I say is just specific to me. It's not everybody. So the way I was taught to write an action scene was uh, to write it as if you're 50 feet away. So a lot of it is muted. And um, I think a lot of the times when I feel the tension getting too big or too crazy, I'll do something that will pull the character back just so we can take a break. And I think of of writing an action scene as writing the plot. So sometimes a plot will just go straight up and sometimes a plot will have mountains where like it's rising and then it's falling and it's rising and falling. Um, and I think of an action scene the same way. So you're rising the tension and then something happens and they'll get a breather and then you do something else. And so it's making its way steady, steadily higher. Um, and that's the way I think of an action scene is kind of looking from 50 feet back. So you can see the cicadas swarming, but you can also see the shadow over the over the fields or the trees or the clouds that are moving in over the sun. You know, those having those moments of stillness in an action scene are really important, I think, to kind of um, help the readers catch their breath when they're in the middle of things. Uh, so I heard I heard you mention this um, in a podcast appearance you did. I mean, you kind of talked about one of those first books you read growing up was The Boxcar Children, which was also my first, like I made my parents buy that whole set. I was like, I need to read all of these. Are there any more um, or other foundational books you remember from childhood that really stuck with you even to this day? Yeah, so I don't know if anyone has read this book, but I think when I was in middle school, we were forced to read this book called Tangerine. Um, and it is about... Oh, it's been a long time since I read it, but I vaguely remember it's about uh, two brothers, I think, and one of the brothers spray paints the younger brother's eyes and he like loses his eyesight. And it's a very um, dark YA book. And the way that it's written is just very dark and you feel like something else is going on underneath. Um, and that book, that book, like, I kept it until I left Vermont. You know, I was 18 when I left Vermont and I kept that book and would reread it in the summers because the way that that author created tension in setting was just amazing. You know, you feel like something else is happening. You feel like um, something's going on and you just can't really put your finger on it. It's just electrifying. And so uh, that book in particular has really stuck with me. And when I'm writing, you know, scenery or setting or a town, I try to make the town have its own personality so it can be electrified like, you know, that town was in that book. And I think, well, you know, one of your many gifts is making that, because that town felt like, I grew up in Connecticut, but I felt like I lived in the setting of Summer of the Cicadas, even though it was very far away from my, you know, small cow town. Um, but I always have a curiosity about the um, the conversation of even just the design of a book because so much can be conveyed in a cover and so much about you know what draws someone to a book you know is the cover so you know when some of the cicadas was coming out was there a conversation about the cover design itself or was it sort of just presented to you yeah so I came up well I didn't come up with the cover design but I was the one I was pretty um staunch about I want the book to have one image and that's going to be this specific. I came up with a cicada image and I said, this is what I want. Um, I want it to be real simple. And I left the rest of it to Red Hen to do. And they kind of matched that like simple kind of design um, because I didn't want it to be, I didn't want it to feel super newfangled. I wanted it to feel kind of dreamlike and kind of old-fashioned and a little bit, you know, hometowny. And the the book cover really, I think, conveys that. The fonts that they chose, I think, conveys the way that the narrative goes. So they, they I just can't say enough good things about Red Hand Press. They've been really great. Are there any, um, you know, just for anyone who's, you know, sort of 
unfamiliar with like indie publishers. Is there any other books coming out from indie publishers that you think, you know, more people should seek out? Uh, so every book that's coming out from Red Hand Press is really good. And I know two of them. I'm doing a, a panel at AWP with a couple of the women. And um, one of them wrote, her name's Melanie Conroy Goldman. And she wrote this book, um, I think it's called The Unlikely World. And that book really stuck with me. I think that's one that is similar in tone and feeling to Summer of the Cicadas. It's very dreamlike, it's her debut. Um, but really anybody that was published in the fall with me, it's just a great group. Like all of the books, I have all of them and I've been working my way through them. Um, Amy Sharon has a book called uh, Unseen City and I really enjoyed that. It's uh, kind of like a ghost story set in New York City in Brooklyn and it's just fantastic. So a lot of the people that are coming out through Red Hen, I'm like, very good. <laughs> Uh, it's such an odd moment to be an author right now. Like with your book coming out, this is a moment when, you know, typically we'd have you here in person, you know, we'd have seats out, we'd have the people all here. I mean, what's it like, what's it been like to have a book come out amid a pandemic when you, you know, doing a lot of digital events and a lot of, you know, virtual events? I'm super happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was really funny because I was on a, a panel with a group on Wednesday and one of the women, she's a lovely poet. She was like, I'm just such a people person. And I love, you know, crowds and going to groups and talking to them. And I'm like, I don't, I like it just, I like people, but like, I don't love presenting in front of a large group. It's that sensory thing again for me, there's just a lot going on. It's really difficult to focus. Um, so honestly, this digital version has worked for me in a lot of ways, I think, you definitely miss out on a lot of the one-on-one -on -one interactions that you could have after, you know, if you're at an event in person, people will wait, they'll come up to you after, you can talk. Um, and teaching, it's really just been, I haven't taught in months because my kind of teaching is you're interacting with the person and my students are teaching me. <laughs> so it just hasn't worked well for me, but the the, the book launch and the readings, it, it's worked well I think I can focus better so I mean I'm, and I'm always curious uh, you know would how do you if, if you had to teach virtually do you think that would change the way you approach writing or, or you know kind of the lessons you might try to impart or the exercises you'd have a writer do yeah you know I was really thinking about how to change some of my lesson plans to fit teaching now and it would really just have to be small group work because there's no way that I can teach without an audience. There's no way that I can, it's a conversation for me. Teaching is not me imparting wisdom because like what? No, it's it's a group thing. It's a, it's a, it's all of us working together to come to a conclusion. And a lot of the times I'll plant the seed, but then the people in the room are the ones that get us there. And without that, for me, my style of teaching just doesn't work very well. So moving forward, you know, if I could do a four or five person group on Zoom or whatever, I, you know, that might work. Um, but I'm really just waiting until things are okay enough to like meet outside and do like a, a group that way, so. Do you, what, like, what was the point in your life where you really knew you wanted to be a novelist? I never wanted to be a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was eight when I knew I wanted to be a writer. And I was eight when I started writing poetry and I won an award when I was like nine for poetry. Um, and I thought I wanted to be a poet. And then I got older and I was like, wow, poetry is really hard. Um, so I stopped doing that and I started writing short stories when I was like in sixth, seventh grade, I would take my spelling words and turn them into stories and get extra credit. And that's how I did life. Um, and from there, it just, I worked with a teacher outside of my school to learn how to write. And she told me that I would never be a good writer until I had life experience. And she was right. So to be a novelist and to be um, the best writer I could be, I had to grow up and I had to go out in the world and do things. And I was never a good writer until after I graduated from my MFA program, because that's when I really started. That's when I came out of the closet. That's when I started being my authentic self. And that's when my writing blossomed. 
Can you maybe talk about what it's like to go through an MFA program? Because I know there's a lot of writers who sort of consider it, whether it's low residency or, you know, full. Can you talk about like what the what that workshop process is like and, you know, getting in and, you know, what it's like to graduate from one? Yeah, so it worked really well for me um, because I was in a low res program. And so I was living in New Jersey, but I actually came down to Tampa. And so I was at University of Tampa. Um, and it was very structured. So we'd wake up and in the morning, there'd be like an early morning seminar, we'd get a break, uh, and then we'd go to our workshops. And those were a small group and everybody had read the material early. You kind of go through, you're guided by an MFA instructor. That was really helpful. Um, in the afternoons, we'd have more seminars. And then usually in the evening, we'd have readings or like things where you like talk to people. Um, so it was a really good mix for me. We're, we were down there for like 10 days at a time, I think. And we do that twice a year. And then in between you do distant learning, distance learning. So you would, you had like a page count you had to meet and you had to read certain books and you're working with an instructor that way. Um, and I worked full time. So for me that, that worked really well. Um, I don't know what the, nor what the like full res MFA looks like. But for people who work or have kids or whatever, the low res program worked well for me. So, uh, and I know you, you said at a young age you're writing poetry, and at University of Tampa, I believe it's Erica Dawson who sort of presides over that program, who's a wonderful poet. I mean, do you still find because there's a lot of poetic, you know, just imagery in here? Like, do you find that poetry still sort of finds its way into your work, even if you're not specifically writing poems? Yeah. So Erica was the director of the program and she actually has a great book um, that came out called When Rap Spoke Straight to God and she provided a blurb for me. Um, and poetry for me, I don't know. I don't think my work is really poetry. I think it's more based on cadence and rhythm. Um, I try to write poetry now. It's just, it's very complicated, but something about the musicality of words and the way that um, the beats fall and the stress falls on different words to me is very engaging. And I do like playing with that. I read everything out loud after I write it. And I kind of, you know, add in words and chop sentences that way because um, the musicality of sentences is like very important to me. And I want it to sound the way I want it to sound, you know, when I'm writing. I feel like that's a really great lesson for writers to read their work out loud to themselves. So is that something you've always done or is that a habit you kind of learned? That is something I was told to do um, because I rushed through writing a lot of times and I was told by my undergraduate professor to read every damn thing that I wrote before submitting it somewhere because I would catch a lot of my own errors. And in that process was kind of where I discovered like, oh, certain words sound a certain way and certain sentences sound a certain way. And from there it kind of developed. And now are there, um, you know, I always try to, you know, let people know to read more poetry just because I, I think it can, you know, fill your life up with something beautiful. I mean, are there any poets that you often turn to or read a lot? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there are a lot and I have a lot of poets on my Facebook feed. Um, but like I said before, it's the cadence of poetry is so different and the, the way that they do tension in poetry is very different. So I have trouble reading a long book of poetry because it'll mess up like the cadence I need for my novel. So when I'm writing a novel, I need to be reading novels because the way that the tension is done and the way the cadence is, is what I need to be emulating, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, you know, something uh, to touch on again, I know um, we spoke about it at the beginning, um, you know, but the character Jess, when we meet her, she's already gone through a lot. I mean, what's it like to write that kind of trauma to create a character with that much, you know, behind them? I, Jess is one of my favorite characters. I think she's just so, she's just such a disaster. And she really is so much of me, you know, at the time that I wrote the book, because there was so many parts of my life that were, you know, not falling together for me. And to write her with a more sordid history than I've ever had um, was really cathartic to kind of work with this character that like is piecing things together with these horrible things that have happened to her. And she's still finding 
you know, threads to put together and she's still finding hope and she's still finding reasons to wake up in the morning. Um, writing her was just, like I say, super cathartic and kind of helped me grow up a lot. Like there's a lot of personal growth that went into figuring that character out. Um, so like she was learning, but I was learning. <laughs> so I'm really thankful for the character and for the book because it did help me kind of grow as a person. So, you, I mean, what's it like to really fall in love with a character like that? I mean, you've written so much. I mean, is it hard to like walk away from a character after that? Or have you found yourself wanting to just put them in more um, works going forward? Yeah, so it depends on the character. Um, for Jess in particular, I needed to let her go. Like as soon as I finished this book, I knew I wasn't gonna write her again. She had her arc. I needed to put her away and I needed to put that part of my life that was influencing the book away. So she went over here. Um, the current book that I'm working on, Blessed Be, the characters are very different. And it's I'm working on a three book series for the first time in my life because I'm like, I'm not done with these characters. I wrote the first book and I'm not finished with them and they are sticking with me and there's more to figure out. Um, so it really just depends on the character and where you are and the things that are happening around you, I think, really influence that. I yeah. uh, also wanted to take a few moments. We have some questions in the chat box that I wanted to feel to you. Uh, so the first one um, comes from Carolyn. Um, when you are really in the weeds writing, how does reading help, if it does, and how widely does your reading stray from your writing style? That's a great question, Carolyn. Um, I try to read, when I'm writing a novel, I try to read similar novels. Um, so with Blessed Be, my agent suggested five different books that were similar to what I was writing. Um, so I read uh, Where the Crawdads Sing. I read, you know, a couple of witch books. Um, and I think just having like I said, again, books with similar cadence and tone really help you fine tune and they can spring different ideas to you. Um, and then when I'm not writing a novel, I do a lot of essay writing and I'll read a lot of Catapult, a lot of um, Roxane Gay has a magazine. So I read a lot of those and that'll help kind of spawn ideas. Like I'll see how people are um, reading essays uh, and that'll help me like think, oh, what if I mashed these two unrelated ideas together? What would happen then? So I'm always kind of just reading when I can because it does spawn a lot of ideas and helps me think of things in different ways. Um, we have another question here from uh, just an acronym MCB. Um, one is someone said you did a very good job in the summer of the cicadas. The town and cicadas are an overarching theme and images that add to the book story. And um, the question is, are you going to AWP with Red Hen once the pandemic is over? Yeah, I think I think AWP is going to be remote this year or like in person and remote or something. I think it'll be remote. And I do have a panel pending that I hope will get approved. Um, and all of the other ladies on the panel are Red Hen authors. They are also fall authors. Um, so Rima is another author that she came out this week. And um, I will be with her and with uh, two others and we'll be talking about writing the gendered body. So if that gets approved, yes, I will be going to AWP and we have yet to see what that's, that whole thing's gonna look like. Uh, we also have one, um, sorry, Mrs. Question, Rebecca. Um, we kind of already covered this, um, but just kind of echoes everyone's love of Jess. Um, <laughs> do any of the characters in this book show up in your next book? I want to see Jess again. Um, yeah, no, uh, not really. I mean, it's, it's a tough one with this book because it was a time in my life that was so difficult and so, um, difficult. <laughs> so really the characters I was writing then, you know, I was immersed with them at the moment. And then when I left Vermont, when I finished the book, I needed to put them away. And I think most of my main characters will have bits and pieces of me, like Jess is bits and pieces of me. Um, so in Blessed Be, the main character is also a little bit of a hot mess, but she's a little bit better. Um, so you'll see similar characters. I think we're all on a journey of, in life of 
learning themes and repeating messages coming to us. So a lot of my characters will be similar, but not the same. Uh, we just got um, a few minutes left and I know um, you might want to do a brief reading and then maybe field a couple more questions after that. Sure. So I hate reading, so I'm going to do <laughs> like a page and a half. Um, I'm going to read the very, very last scene of the book. So the last two pages. After dropping Maggie at Mason's house, I drive the old route home. Rocks kick up under my car. It smells like pine, like normal. I kick the corners, speeding up when I should slow down. It reminds me of high school, curving back home after prom, all cried out of tears after sitting there all night long, wanting to dance with someone but finding no one. I get home and park the car. The crickets sing their song, high and sweet. It smells like grass in summer, the heat of the sun that lingers in baked earth. I love this house, these woods, but even with the job, even with the award, with Mason, Brenda, this place is haunted. The only thing that makes it better is the ranger supervisor training I'm going to next week in DC. Sabina called me a few weeks ago and told me about the job it's for. I'll be working out west in the state parks as a ranger. They haven't decided where to place me yet, but most likely it'll be in Yellowstone National Park. I've cleaned the house up, trying to get something to feel right so I can leave it without worrying. I finished the insulation. I cleaned up the outside, shearing down the trees. The yard sits plucked free of weeds, green in a bloom of rain that's fallen across the area. Haze lingers over the grass, a warm ray of moisture from the wetness of the earth. After dropping my things off in the bedroom, I head downstairs. I take out some whiskey and pour it in a shot glass. Set it on the counter and stare at it, but don't drink it. More and more lately, I keep pouring myself drinks that I don't drink. I've been running every day, training my body back to how it used to be. I still wake up with this pain in my chest though. It strikes me out of the blue sometimes. A warm breeze fetters in through the kitchen window, tinted with my mom's perfume. I head for my parents' room. Everything is still there, exactly where I left it, like it's always been. I walk through the bedroom to the porch and open the door. Hot air blasts me in the face. It smells like grass and wet dirt, like the days after the crash and everything that hurts bad. I lie down flat so my back is pressed into the wood planks and close my eyes. The heat won't leave until October. It simmers over the trees, the horizon of the pines. It's in the air, warm and wet when I breathe. If I imagine hard enough, I can see myself lifting into the air. I rise above the ground, higher and higher until I can see the tops of the trees and then the layout of the town, like a heart-shaped patch, a sea of green and gold cupped by a dark shadow of forest. It's just staggeringly beautiful. That is, I mean, how do you get to that end? Like, how do you know when you've like hit that point? Cause there's once again, just so many lovely sensory details, you know, from, uh, you know, just like the, I think like the way you describe the heat not leaving, it's like this, you know, this like as if a blanket will be pulled in October, or like the mother's perfume through the screen. How did you know when you really had your ending for this book? This one was uh, special in that I actually wrote the last paragraph kind of when I was in the first chapter. So I was in the first chapter and then all of a sudden I had this, the heart-shaped patch and the girl soaring over the, the town and looking at it from above. And so I wrote that last paragraph and just kind of set it aside and was like, I don't know if I'm going to get there, but like, if I do, that's cool. And then I, I got there eventually. Um, and that doesn't usually happen. Usually I have to work a little bit harder to figure out my endings, but that one just kind of snuck in there. So. Uh, we also have one more question in the chat box now. Um, they want to know, are, are you still writing essays? I've read and enjoyed many of your published works. Yeah. I try to write essays a lot. It's, um, I've just been wiped out with the novel, um, but I have one that just got picked up um, and it'll be out in September or October, I think. Um, so that's from Cold, Cold Hill Review, I think. And so I'll, I'll post that, but yeah, I'm still writing essays. Every time I get a break between novel stuff, I'll kind of just revert to that short form of, of essay writing. 
And see, to me, like essays are the hardest form of writing there is. I mean, I mean what's it like, you know, tackling an essay? Like, how do you know when there's like a topic you truly want to go after? It's tough. So when I start, I only started writing essays like two or three years ago. And actually Vicky, who's on this call, was the one that kind of taught me how to write essays because I had no formal, you know, background or education in writing essays. And what I was writing in the beginning was terrible. It was awful. <laughs> but she kind of stuck with me. Um, and now that I understand the way that an essay is structured, it's a little bit easier when I have an idea come to me. I'll understand the way that it fits into the structure of an essay. And if I have two competing ideas that are swirling, you know, I kind of understand how to braid them a little bit better. But um, essays are something I'm still learning and they're hard. But, you know, I think, again, they're like fiction in that you learn something from yourself when you write them. So. And are these, um, for anyone on the call, are we able to find these on your website, um, the published essays? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can find them on, on my website. Um, they're all up there. The, the best one I think that's up there, I won the Mary C. Moore Award. And so that's through the Southern Indiana Review. And I think that's probably the best, the best one to take a look at. Uh, in the chat box, Vicki wants you to know, oh my goodness, not <laughs> terrible. Yeah, they were. <laughs> and we also have a question from uh, Brenda R. who asks, um, who inspired you to start writing? Um, or did you realize that you had that gift? I have no idea what started it. I think I just was writing in a unique way and my teachers were like, oh, wow, hey. And I liked attention. So I was like, oh, hey, I can do this. And then as I grew, it started to become something that really defined me and something that I really enjoyed. Um, so while it was kind of surface level in the beginning, there were no writers that really you know, stuck out to me. It was just my own thoughts on the page and the feedback I got from other people. And then it just kind of grew into like my thing. Are there any sort of previously, you know, maybe like works that you, you, um, you may have written, did a draft of, they didn't get published that you sort of have and you think you might turn back to one day or like sort of ideas that you're like, it wasn't right at the time, but I think I can go back to this now. Yeah, so the book about the girl on the island, um, I definitely am gonna push for that at some point. That's gonna be something, it needs a lot of work, but it's, I think it's good and I think it'll go somewhere. And then like four or five years ago when I was living in the Keys, I wrote this story. Um, this really like scary, weird novel. Um, and some of the people on this call have read it, but I really liked it. It never went anywhere. I was very young at the time. And so I'm interested in going back in and seeing if I can clean it up a bit. But a lot of times with my older works, I can't because the person I am now is not the person I was then. And it's very hard for me to capture that mindset again so we'll we'll just see what happens with those uh, just speaking of the keys i mean what's it, what's it like to live and write in the keys because it's such a storied place and it's you know this vacation spot but it's also this like it's like its own you know country almost at times like can you maybe talk about what your time was like in the keys yeah the keys are really strange it's strange to live there because it is such a vacation place and i wrote my first book it was set in the keys um and it's, there's this really like dark underbelly about the Keys. Um, it's the highest, it has the highest suicide rate in the state. A lot of people go down there to retire or to die. Um, and there's just this really dark underbelly to it. And for me, living and writing in the Keys for two years was kind of discovering that dark underbelly and how I fit there and how that impacted me because it had a very very immense impact on me as a human and me as a writer to live there and to to be a part of that community for a while. There is that we we are at time right now, but you know before we sort of sign off, if there are any you know final words you want to say about summer of the cicadas, you know what people can expect or you know why they should pick it up and what would you want to say? Um, I think it's a book about growth. So if you are working on yourself. If you're thinking about working on yourself, uh, it's a book that you can pick up and watch somebody else's journey and, you know, that may inspire you on your own. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you, Kelsey, for putting this all together. Thank everyone for joining us for this virtual event. You know, once again, we have Summer and Cicadas by Chelsea Catherine here in the store. Um, make an appointment. You can shop by appointment all weekend. Just visit tombolobooks.com to make that. We also have curbside pickup available all weekend and every day of the week.
Um, but if you want to see, you know, some wonderful booksellers and have us give you some recommendations, I'm going to tell you to read this. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, listen, thank you all for joining us. Yeah, and I'm going to say um, thank you again to Chelsea. Thank you so much for, you know, working with me to get this together and um, being so generous with your time. And Andrew for participating in this. Thank you so much. And um, join us for some more really great events that are going to be coming down the pipeline very, very soon. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. So thank you, everyone. Have a really great evening. Bye. Bye.